year was 2047. And this is all that was left. The great space wars between the Muscafarians and the Bezosites had depleted Earth of all its natural resources. The Bitcoin virus and Uber's robot chauffeurs had finished the job. The only signs that humans had ever been here were the ramshackle buildings and the windmills that kept spinning and spinning with nothing to power. Everyone had abandoned Earth. Everyone, except for this man. He was known as Dejer Molnar. And he tore s*** up. There's a modicum of truth in all of this. If you want to know what the world will look like when it's a rundown mess, you can head to the Mojave Desert. It's here that you'll find some of the world's greatest, or at least most eccentric, inventors. This craft is the sexy beast. Pushing machines to their limits. It's a place that froths with engineering passion and that offers total freedom to relentless tinkerers. Join me on a road trip across the Mojave, from Los Angeles all the way to Las Vegas, as we meet people trying to change the future of cars. We are self-driving. And to make space cheap and easy. We're working on point-to-point -point travel one day. For decades, LA has been home to two thriving communities of builders, the people who design cars and the people who build spaceships. Many of them work in polished studios and massive industrial buildings. But the man I'm looking for works in a place like this. Taja, how are you? <laughs> Good to see you, man. Good to see you, too. <laughs> this is Deja Molnar. And this is where he keeps his toys. So when we're driving slow, we keep the uh, uh, landing gear down. And then once we hit the freeway and we're in second gear, I'll bring the wheels up. So don't freak out when you hear that sound. <laughs> Desher used to fly planes in the Air Force. Then he built rockets and rocket-powered cars. He's been in some bands. He's been rich. He's been poor. He's a free spirit who does whatever he wants. Like a lot of Angelinos, Dejer often finds himself stuck for hours on the freeway, wishing there was a way to rise up and escape from the concrete prison. This is my first attempt at a flying car. The flying car as, as a, uh, a development has often been mired in the idea that you have to make something for everybody and that you have to dumb it down so that it's a consumer product to cut a few seconds off of somebody's commute. I don't have the objective about creating ubiquity. Da Vinci did one copy of the Mona Lisa, and it wasn't for everybody, and it wasn't like you had to make 500 of them, but it still has value. And I see a lot of the machines that have been made as art pieces, and I think what they need is a gallery right now to help drive the interest in the development. To drum up that interest, Desert soon plans to start a flying car racing league in the Mojave Desert. There's a long-standing marriage between LA and the Mojave. It's in LA where engineers go about their day jobs in fancy offices. And it's in the Mojave where the folks who can never stop experimenting go to try out their ideas on the weekends. Mojave is sort of what? It's like the, the playground for the test bed. And it's about the people you want to meet as opposed to the people that you don't need. It's, those are the freaks you know, that, that <laughs> matter to me, are the ones that want to go out there and take their 300 mile an hour jet car out on a Saturday afternoon yeah. or whatever. 
All right, I'll see you at the free. Okay. <laughs> and we'll, 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 you can join the club. <laughs> Mojave is about a two hour drive into the California desert from Los Angeles. And most of that time is spent staring at bumpers. God, this traffic sucks. You deal with this, and yes, a flying car seems like a great idea. But as we made our way out into the Inventor Badlands, the reality of zipping across the desert in a loose assembly of metal pipes and good intentions felt somewhere between stupid and terrifying. The truth, though, is that much of this technology is tried and true. The first part of Desert's flying car plan hinges on this gyrocopter. These types of vehicles have been flying since the 1920s. They're cheap, relatively easy to build, and pretty reliable. Instead of running on a motor, the propeller gets its lift from the wind as the craft goes forward. It's incredible, man. It's crazy. You just get like this totally different perspective. If the engine cuts out, the copter would just flutter down to the ground, like a leaf falling out of a tree. My adrenaline was pumping right before we took off, but uh -huh. you know, like the second we were in the air, I mean, you just yeah. Uh, there's you, a lot to see, and it's pretty here. And... Sort of forget about it all. Yeah. And as you saw, I mean, obviously, there's we can land anywhere out here, yeah. so it's a perfect place. The gyrocopter takes care of the up part of the flying car puzzle, but you still need something to deal with the roads. For that, Desher has this slick concept vehicle. The goal is to marry the two and have something that turns just about any road into a runway. When that happens, okay, if that happens, the select few willing to give it a go will taste freedom, while the rest of us rot on the 405. I think that the reality is that a lot of people in this world like to have some kind of an advantage in life, no matter what they're doing, whether it's a bigger stereo or a, uh, you know, a swimming pool at their house. But the reality is that in nature, all birds can walk, all bugs that fly have legs, and they can fold their wings up on their back. They survive in different environments because they've adapted to get through them. To say that we're gonna spend 40 billion hours a year in the United States sitting in traffic, saying that, well, no one will ever have one of these, I don't really care if that's the party line. You can make something that will allow you to escape this ridiculous ant line of eternity. Out here in the Mojave, there's testing rockets, and then there's testing rockets. To be a kick-ass rocket company, you know, you need to test a lot. The folks who succeed are able to iterate quickly. Many of America's top rocketeers work here. It's the Mojave Airport, which is situated smack dab in the center of Mojave the town. This is where the big kids play with fire. And the pyromaniacs over at Virgin Galactic hope to soon offer tourists a chance to visit space for about $250,000 per ticket, or about twice that on StubHub. George Whitesides is a NASA veteran and serves as the CEO of Virgin Galactic. He gave me a tour of their operations, which includes a test stand for breaking in rocket engines. Nature does not like what we're trying to do here. <laughs> the art of this is taking something that nature doesn't want and sort of bending it into an outcome. Virgin spaceship will be carried into the air underneath a plane. The spaceship will then fire up its own thrusters and head for the heavens. It's a complex system, and there are few places on Earth where you can work out the kinks. It's the only place in the United States where you can design, manufacture, and test a rocket motor and then integrate it on a spaceship and fly it into space. Right. You know, this is, this is really the frontier of American aerospace. 
Virgin wants to offer more than just a joyride. It thinks people visiting space, even for just a few minutes, will have a profound effect on how we all see our planet. You know, so we've got 700 people, order of magnitude, signed up to go on our spaceship. That's more than the number of people who have ever been to space yeah. in 50 years. But they're going to go back to communities all over the world, and they're going to bring that perspective with them. And I think that's going to have a really important effect. The story of Virgin has been one of great promise and devastating setbacks. In 2014, the company's first spaceship crashed to the ground, killing the co-pilot and injuring the pilot. Today at this press event, Virgin hopes to restore confidence in its technology by unveiling Spaceship Two, Richard Branson's attempt to resurrect the galactic empire from the ashes. This one has taken more than 10 years. You're still not at the point where we're flying yet. How difficult has this business been compared to your others? It is rocket science. Uh, it is uh, really difficult. We're just reinventing the wheel completely, reinventing the technology. So um, it's been tough, but we now have uh, you know, rockets that we know will take us to space. You know, we feel confident that we're finally very, very close to being there. Ever a good and devoted son, Branson decorated the spaceship with his mother's likeness. And ever the good showman used the spaceship's unveiling as an excuse to throw a birthday party for his granddaughter. That's a bottle of milk made out of sugar being used for the christening. In 2014, after the accident, how close were you to, to um, calling? I don't think I've ever given up on anything in, in life, um, but it, we would have been irresponsible not to ask the questions. The important thing is not to um, hurry a program like this. The important thing is to get it right and make sure it's safe for people to go up and, um, and that we offer return tickets, not single tickets. It's the sort of invitation you wait a lifetime to receive. Come to the Mojave, he says. We're camping out next to the Trona Pinnacles. They're weird and beautiful, he says. There will be beers and burgers and tequila and a bunch of gearheads and techno freaks hanging out together. We're gonna show you how we're reinventing cars, he says. And we're gonna go spine crushing fast. This is Mouse McCoy. He's a sort of hot rod renaissance man with a vision. One where the cars of tomorrow are designed by artificial intelligence. Right now we're in this phase where, like this stuff seemed like science fiction, but it's actually science fact. <laughs> like we're living science fact right before our eyes and to be a part of it, this feels, feels good, man. Mouse's latest venture is called Hack Rod. The goal is to blend human emotion and technology to spur an automotive revolution. To do this, Mouse and his team measure everything they can. They wire up cars with dozens of sensors to see how the metal performs. Then they create 3D maps of their racing courses to figure out exactly how the car behaves. And on top of all that, they strap brainwave monitors on their heads to detect stress. I think it's safe to say that as I strap in for today's test, I'm showing signs of anxiety already. Hopefully we'll see pure panic in the uh, brain monitor. <laughs> the Hackrod team doesn't start with an off-the-shelf car chassis. They use artificial intelligence software to come up with designs and fabricate them on a 3D printer. Design software and new manufacturing techniques have gotten good enough to allow a small group of people to build custom cars from scratch. We're getting in this mass world where just design decisions are dictated. Your aesthetic is dictated by some corporate strategy somewhere. And it's like, you know, <laughs> and that was that hot rodder, you know, sort of thing. And a lot of our mission here is going to be about individualization, like having your own yeah. design, having your own vehicle. 
which is a full car. Felix Holst used to oversee the Hot Wheels and Matchbox brands for Mattel. He's a car junkie who quit the Mattel gig to start Hackrod with Mouse. We think this may be the first chassis that's been engineered with artificial intelligence. That AI sucks up data collected from the desert field tests. Felix gives it a few guidelines, and it spits out a body design. You test it, feed the data back in, and get an even better car out. What used to take years and hundreds of engineers can now be done in a matter of months, or so Hackrod hopes to prove. We both come from that kind of hot rod culture, that hacker culture, and we, we looked at this as like, look, we're not Ford or Ferrari or whoever. We don't have hundreds and hundreds of engineers to start designing a chassis from the ground up. And there's a real democratization of creativity and design going on that we, that we, that we stand for. This car is called the Mule. It was the first built using Hackrod technology and it's been utterly abused by Mouse over the course of three days. Soon, it will be time to head back to LA and let the computers do their work to replace it with Mule 2.0. What's your vision for where this company is in like five years? In five years, I think we will have been a significant driver in the automatic manufacturing world that's coming. After spending a couple of days at Trona, getting covered in grease and dust, so much dust, I plotted my escape from the Mojave. My final stop would be Las Vegas. Given the nature of this trip, I couldn't just hop in any old Honda. I needed something special, something that would leave a mark on Sin City. So I hit up an old friend who happens to have his own homemade, self-driving car. Problem solved. We were a couple miles out of Barstow when the acid kicked in. Where Hunter S. Thompson had Dr. Gonzo as a companion, I have this guy, George Hotz. He comes with less drugs, but plenty of fear and loathing. Hotz became famous as a teenager for hacking everything in sight. He hacked the iPhone, he hacked the Sony PlayStation. He has the legal fees to prove it. And now, he's hacking cars. He stunned the world last year by building this self-driving car by himself in his San Francisco garage in just a couple of months. I visited him back then to see his Acura, packed full of cameras, radars, and artificial intelligence software. Unlike the Teslas and Googles of the world, Hotz doesn't give his car a litany of rules to follow. He basically just drives the thing, and the car learns to mimic the behavior, and does so better and better over time. Don't get off the exit. Don't do it. I know you want to. I know you want to. I know you see that exit. <laughs> oh, good job, car. Hotz hasn't bested Knight Rider yet but he has achieved Hasselhoff-esque heights of confidence. Meanwhile, back on the road to Vegas. Soon, we'll probably be able to drive without radar. Just using the camera. Just using a camera, and cameras, like our cell phone. That camera is good enough to drive the car. I could keep bashing everyone like I'm the underdog, but am I really the underdog? I have a working self-driving car. <laughs> Not everyone appreciates Hot's unique brand of gusto. The California DMV, for example, recently told Hot's to quit driving his experiment on the state's roads. This is why we've had to head to the Nevada border, where the true freedom of the Mojave lives on. We're getting close to We're getting the border. Close to the border. I'll press the button once we hit the border. Why can't we do it in California? They don't like innovation. <laughs> Nevada loves innovation. That's what I heard. Oh, I see the sign. I see the sign. Prepare to engage. <laughs> <laughs> On your command, Captain. All right, here we go. Welcome to Nevada. Three. The Silver State. Two. One. We are self-driving. Hatz's car had never seen the Nevada roads before, but it drove perfectly on its own for miles. 
That is, until the desert sun dipped down, casting shadows across the road. This is actually the worst time of day for it. Uh, the contrast is not very good, because the sun is so bright still, and the road is so dim. And look, you see, no, 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 you can't drive. Wow. Look, I can't see anything in the picture. This is really bad. What does no. this make you think? Is this something you can fix over time? A lot of this has to do with the camera. A lot of the bug right now is just because the camera can't see. As we finally made our way onto the Vegas Strip, I tried to cheer him up. Well, let's just see what happens. It might go too soon. It might go too soon. Oh no, it sees him there. It sees him there. Yeah, go car, go! Here we go. Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Don't hit the van! Don't hit the van! Oh, Woo! Nice. Very nice. Whoa! That's closer than it should have gone. Hutz's car passed the test and his existential angst lifted. The legend of Dr. Hotz lives on. Feeling better now? Yeah, that was good, that was good. It's easy to be cynical these days in Knock America. It's the place with the tubby people who forgot how to make things and who don't like to get their hands dirty anymore. But then, you come somewhere like Mojave. This is Colossus. It came to life here in England at Bletchley Park in 1943. The machine raced to decrypt German messages by analyzing thousands of words of coded text every second. With its mix of vacuum tubes, wires, and switches, Colossus emerged as the first electronic programmable computer. Its arrival gave the Allies a huge edge in World War II and saved thousands of lives. It also marked the start of the information age. England built 10 of the Colossus machines, and they became the heart of its booming computing industry. Actually, no. This is a replica of Colossus. The real machines were destroyed after the war so that the pesky Russians wouldn't find out about the technology. The metaphor then is a simple one. England dismantled decades of pioneering computing work because it seemed like the proper thing to do. And it suffered the consequences ever since. I doubt many of you can name a single tech product or startup that hails from this country. What you'll see next then may come as a real shock. Because in its very subdued, self-effacing way, England has in fact given rise to a handful of tech companies that have impacted the world on an immense scale. I'm heading from London to Cambridge and into the English countryside to find the best technology that England has to offer. Along the way, there will be fancy hair dryers and AI-infused software. So hello, my name is Oba. What is your name? And of course, there will be a spot of tea. If you tried to design the perfect university town, you would probably fail to think up something as idyllic as Cambridge. It's a city filled with temples to learning and young, 
privileged brainiacs. Hop on a bike, and you can go on a ride through academic history, from Newton's apple tree, right on up to the pub, where Watson and Crick drank to celebrate the discovery of DNA's double helix. If that seems boring, you can also be ritually abused at the old Cambridge Market. Come on, man. Thanks. Oh, it's like sour soap. <laughs> Today, Cambridge also serves as the heart of England's tech industry, with its research centers, startups, and massive biotech firms. Outside of the university, the biggest reason for Cambridge's technology success is a company called Arm. It designs chips, and they're the brains at the center of almost every iPhone and Android smartphone. In short, the modern world runs on ARM. I've met up with my old friend and ARM co-founder, Mike <laughs> Muller, to share a warm British beer and find out how this happened. We're in a pub. What has a pub meant to ARM over its history? We met our first CEO in a pub. We are in the pub that's uh, about 100 yards away from um, where we actually started. And in those days, we used to come here every lunchtime. So yeah, it's played an important part in the business. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Arm started on something of a whim. Its first major customer was Apple, which needed a chip for its upcoming Newton handheld device. Instead of making a screaming fast, super hot chip like everyone else, Arm decided to make a low power, energy efficient chip. Soon enough, making low power chips became Arm's thing. It took a while for the bet to pay off, but once mobile phones and then smartphones arrived, Arm ended up as a major force. A lifetime, our partners have shipped over 80 billion different chips, and last year there was about two per person on the planet, so that's about 15 billion ARM chips shipped, so they're in everything. Phones, printers, anti-lock brakes, televisions, Wi-Fi routers, cloud servers, medical devices. I could keep going. To Muller's point, one of the most innovative, and glorious things built around an ARM chip is Raspberry Pi. It might not look like much, but this $35 assembly of electronics is a fully functioning computer. There's the ARM chip right here, tons of USB ports, an Ethernet port, even an HDMI port. With this teeny little thing, you can do just about anything. Released in 2012, the Pi has inspired near religious devotion among geeky hobbyists and inventors. Some of them show off their Pi creations at things called Raspberry Jams. I went to see David Pride, who has a shrine to the low cost personal computer at his home in Gloucester. What is this little device meant to you? It's changed my life. I was very happy, very stable. I had a nice, well-paid job, but I was very, very bored. And I realized at that point, if I wanted to do something different, this was, this was the opportunity to learn the skills that I'd always wanted to learn. Electronics, robotics, coding. His house is littered with Pi creations, from motorized cars to robots. Greetings to everyone watching Hello World. <laughs> That's a nice touch. <laughs> His most famous invention, though, is the Forbot, an AI-infused machine that plays a mean, albeit slow, game of Connect Four. That is cool, man. <laughs> How long did it take you to make this? About three months of evenings and weekends. So it makes it you. you oh, make, now I have to go. You make your move but it is now thinking about the move it's taken. Oh, you bastard. You've just lost. I feel ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should have done more for the humans.
To really understand the soul of the Raspberry Pi, I had to head back to its birthplace in Cambridge and take a boat trip with Eben Upton. He's the computer scientist that invented the pie. Around 2007, Eben grew alarmed by the declining number of computer science students in England and decided to try and inspire the youngsters with a new approach. I've always assumed Cambridge is the best place in the world to study computer science. It's certainly the best place in the UK. And we saw this collapse in the number of people applying to study computer science at the University of Cambridge. Which is crazy as the computing industry is blowing yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, you know, the computing industry is blowing up. Obviously, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful environment to come and to come and study in. The theory we came up with was that um, most of us who were arriving in the mid-90s, like I did, had grown up with cheap programmable 8-bit microcomputers. You grew up using the BBC Micro. I grew that's up with, what got you into Yeah, computing. that's it. I had a BBC Micro at school. It sat in the corner of the classroom. And those were beautiful machines. Supported by the UK government, the BBC Micro gave many students their first taste of coding and the possibility of what computers could do. I'm just going to scroll up. The Pi has very much followed in this tradition and emerged as a consumer hit along the way. It's now the third best-selling computer of all time, behind the Mac and the PC. Our lifetime dream volume was 10,000 units, now we're closing in on 10 million. But as that's happened, we've just got more ambitious, we've just got more greedy, I guess, about what we're trying to accomplish. We've gone from, can we move the needle from 200 to 600 people applying to computer science at Cambridge to, yeah, can we do the same for other universities? Can we do the same for other countries? Can we do the same for other subjects? Think big, Jason Statham impersonator. Think big. The intellectual underpinnings of computing began here in Cambridge. In 1833, the Cambridge-trained mathematician Charles Babbage built a prototype of this thing, the difference engine. It could solve equations with the turn of a crank and some gears, and is considered the first mechanical computer. A hundred years later, in the 1930s, another Cambridge mathematician named Alan Turing devised the concepts behind the modern-day computer. He proved that a machine can be programmed to calculate just about anything. Decades after Turing and Babbage, Cambridge is still at the cutting edge of computing. Companies like Microsoft place their research centers here to tap into the local academic talent and to explore their most ambitious ideas. Chris Bishop runs this lab and oversees research in a number of areas. One of the most compelling and frightening areas is artificial intelligence. This is just an amazingly exciting time in artificial intelligence. More and more tasks are becoming solved in image understanding, in uh, speech recognition, and so on. So although we've got a very long way to go before we get to the, the full capabilities of the human brain, there is a sense that for some kinds of tasks, sort of the barriers have been removed. Computer scientists have dreamed of creating a true artificial intelligence for decades. They've been hunting for a machine that can equal or surpass humans. Recently, people like Bishop have started to make real headway thanks to an approach called machine learning. If you go back to the time of Turing, computing is about logic, it's about determinism. And the, the code, the instructions which the computer runs are cr created by a human. What we're seeing in machine learning is something very different. Instead of programming the computer to solve the task, we program the computer to learn from experience. And then we train the computer by showing it lots of examples, giving it lots of data. AI powers a ton of experiments here, including this computer vision simulation. Microsoft's Kinect sensor used to struggle to make out a hand, and now 
It can pinpoint the movement of fingers. There's also an AI-powered movie recommendation algorithm for Xbox that does a pretty good job at figuring out my eclectic taste in movies. You know, actually, I mean, I did like Twister. OK. Let's see what happens this time. So now we see a big change. <laughs> this lab isn't just about entertainment, though. They're actually saving lives with a program that can tell the difference between cancerous brain tissue and healthy tissue in an MRI. What you see here is a, a pretty nasty uh, brain tumor. So what the machine learning is doing now is it's labeling it according to uh, whether it's tissue that's already died or whether it's tissue that is uh, cancerous and proliferating. This is really important because this is used to design treatment. So we'll fire in radiation from lots of different directions and we'll tune up the, the amount and direction of the radiation to try and kill as much of the cancer as possible, but to do as little damage to the normal tissue as we can. Down the street from Microsoft, there's a startup that already has its AI technology in the wild. It's called Audio Analytic, and you can think of it as a type of Shazam for real-world sounds. We use artificial intelligence to allow smart home devices to recognize a whole range of different sounds that happen inside your houses. It can make your house a bit secure by detecting glass windows being broken and then turning your lights and scare away in the burglar, actually taking active protection of, you know, the things you care about. So what do we have here? What, what is all this stuff? Um, so we've got a, a couple of devices that make the sounds that uh, this detects. A smoke alarm. Yeah. So you see it's detected smoke alarm on there. Nobody's at home, so it's now sending a high message. Another sound, um, this is glass break. Yeah. Set that off. You can see it says window broken. Yeah. What is the science behind all of this? We had to do a whole bunch of innovation in terms of understanding sounds, how to detect them, how to have a machine understand them, even if we take a simple sound like a smoke alarm. It goes beep. Well, now we've got two of them going beep at different times. With a whole bunch of background noise going on. That's a big AI problem to solve. Computers have to be trained to distinguish one sound from another and to learn the unique signature of, say, glass breaking. Of course, no two breaking windows sound exactly alike. So these guys get to relieve stress by breaking a lot of glass. How many windows have you had to break? Windows, we literally filled warehouses for it on months on end. Different sizes, different thicknesses, different type of glass. How many smoke alarms? Smoke alarms, we've literally bought all smoke alarms you can find on the marketplace and then indexed all of those. That was a huge undertaking logistically. The software can also recognize the sound of a baby crying. Hi, Daisy. <laughs> oh, hi. And as luck would have it, we found a cute, hungry baby on which to experiment. So you can see on the screen it's detecting the baby cry. Audio analytics software already ships inside a number of smart home products, and the company plans on adding many more sounds. There we go. But for now, it's the perfect technology to discover when an angry baby has thrown a smoke alarm through a window. I arrived in England at the height of Brexit mania. The tourists were happy because the entire country had gone on sale. Some of the locals were morose, and some of them just didn't care, like the people drinking these $20 cocktails at a fancy hotel bar. Nothing says hello to financial ruin like sipping rum from an elephant made of Legos, or gin from whatever this is. You know who else doesn't care about Brexit? People willing to pay $400 for a hair dryer. Dyson, as we all know, has perfected suck. Now, it's on to blow. Meet 
the supersonic. According to the ample Dyson propaganda, this is the smartest hair dryer ever built. It uses an electric digital motor to produce an intense stream of air and then sensors to make sure that air never gets too hot. As a result, your hair comes out shinier and healthier than ever before. I feel like uh, I'm two inches taller now. <laughs> <laughs> To see how Dyson built this thing, I had to leave London and head to the company's headquarters in the picturesque town of Malmesbury. James Dyson founded this company in 1991 and has created his very own engineering paradise. The Dyson campus is littered with his toys. Of course you have a plane in the cafeteria. And made up of a handful of invention factories. My first stop is with someone who leads a constant battle to come up with ideas for brand new products and reinvent some old ones. Hair dryers just haven't changed in sort of 60 years. If we look at this, this cutaway here, um, you see they've got a very large motor inside, like that. But that weight you're holding, you know, for 20 minutes, half an hour while you're drying yeah. your hair. And very, very noisy. So we thought it was a really good product for us to get into. Dyson spent four years and $71 million to bring the Supersonic to life. And, as you might expect, they're obsessive compulsive when it comes to hair. We felt that we had to learn everything about hair, the science of hair. We had to build our own laboratory to learn about hair for ourselves and learn what causes damage, what causes shine, what makes your hair look lovely. Hi, Matthew. Hi. Welcome to Lab 61. Thank you very much. Matthew Child is Dyson's electric motor wizard. He spent more than a decade developing the core of so many Dyson products. The vacuums have big motors, and the hair dryer has this tiny thing, a miniature turbine. This is more attuned to a, a jet engine you find on a commercial airline than anything else. How fast does it spin around? 115,000 RPM. So that's about 1,800 revolutions every second. Yeah, that seems almost impossible. It's possible through very fast electronics <laughs> and a mechanical system that is able to take the stresses, the strains, for hundreds of hours at full speed. The electric motor technology will be key to Dyson's continued push into new product areas. Some people say it's secretly working on an electric car. What types of things would this be useful in? Um, well, at the moment, we've applied it to the air dryer. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what comes next. <laughs> I knew you would say that. <laughs> I can only say that. <laughs> the drive to invent and salesmanship present at Dyson is something of an anomaly here. England's beloved cynicism runs counter to the hype-fueled optimism that dominates the tech industry. The Brits do a fine job at promoting a pub lunch but do less well at spurring on entrepreneurs and inventors. It's clear enough, though, that when the English really get stuck into something, they do it well. It's not hyperbole to say that arms chips have changed the world, or that Raspberry Pi may well have altered a generation for the better. And if you're inclined to try and think big, there remains no better place to do it than in Cambridge where you can meditate in peace among the cows. As fall breaks out in Canada, I'm reminded of all the beauty, innocence, and gun-free fun available from our neighbors to the north.
there's the majesty of Toronto. Vast hockey rinks. And gallons of maple syrup that you can chug openly and guilt-free. For this maple syrup is pure and nourishing. The changing of the seasons also happens to be the perfect time to encounter one of Canada's most prized creatures, the artificial intelligence nerd. Ever since people first came up with the idea of computers, they've dreamed of imbuing them with artificial intelligence. I am a smart fellow, as I have a very fine brain. That's the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. AI is just a computer that is able to mimic or simulate uh, human thought or human behavior. Uh, within that, there's a subset called machine learning that is now the underpinning of what is most exciting about AI. By allowing computers to learn how to solve problems on their own, machine learning has made a series of breakthroughs that once seemed nearly impossible. It's the reason computers can understand your voice, spot a friend's face in a photo, and steer a car. And it's the reason people are actively talking about the arrival of human-like AI, and whether that would be a good thing or a horrific end of days thing. Many people made this moment possible, but one figure towers above the rest. I've come to the University of Toronto to see the man they call the godfather of modern artificial intelligence, Jeff Hinton. Because of a back condition, Jeff Hinton hasn't been able to sit down for more than 12 years. I hate standing. I'd much rather sit down, but if I sit down, I have a disc that comes out. So. Okay. Well, at least now standing desks are fashionable. And yeah, but I was ahead. <laughs> I, was standing when, I was standing when they weren't fashionable. <laughs> Since he can't sit in a car or on a bus, Hinton walks everywhere. The walk says a lot about Hinton and his resolve. For nearly 40 years, Hinton has been trying to get computers to learn like people do. A quest almost everyone thought was crazy, or at least hopeless. Right up until the moment it revolutionized the field. Google thinks this is the future of the company. Amazon thinks it's the future of the company. Apple thinks it's the future of the company. My own department thinks this stuff's probably nonsense and we shouldn't be doing any more of it. <laughs> so, so I talked everybody into it except my own department. <laughs> Jeff Hinton, pretty early on, became obsessed with this idea of figuring out how the mind works. He started off getting into physiology, the anatomy of how the brain works, then he got into psychology, and then finally he settled on more of a computer science approach to modeling the brain and got into artificial intelligence. My feeling is, if you want to understand a really complicated device, like a brain, you should build one. I mean, you could look at cars and you could think you could understand cars. When you try and build a car, you suddenly discover that there's this stuff that has to go under the hood, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> As Jeff was starting to think about these ideas, he got inspired by some AI researchers across the pond. Specifically this guy, Frank Rosenblatt. Rosenblatt um, in the late 1950s developed what he called a perceptron, and it was a neural network, a computing system that would mimic the brain. The basic idea is a collection of small units called neurons. These are little computing units, but they're actually modeled on the way that the human brain does its computation. They take incoming data like we do from our senses and they actually learn so the neural net can learn to make decisions over time. Rosenblatt's hope was that you could feed a neural network a bunch of data, like pictures of men and women, 
and it would eventually learn how to tell them apart, just like humans do. There was just one problem. It didn't work very well. Rosenblatt, his neural network was the single layer of neurons, and it was limited in what it could do, extremely limited. And a colleague of his wrote a book in the late 60s that showed these limitations. And it kind of put the whole area of research into a deep freeze for a good 10 years. No one wanted to work in this area. They were sure it would never work. Well, almost no one. It was just obvious to me that it was the right way to go. The brain's a big neural network, and so it has to be that stuff like this can work because it works in our brains. There's just never any doubt about that. Now, what do you think it was inside of you that kept you wanting to pursue this when everyone else was giving up, just that you thought it was the right direction to go? No, that everyone else was wrong. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Hinton decides he's got an idea of how these neural nets might work and he's gonna pursue it no matter what. For a little while, he's bouncing around research institutions in the US. He kind of gets fed up that most of them are funded by the Defense Department, and he starts looking for somewhere else he can go. He suddenly hears that Canada might be interested in funding artificial intelligence. And that was very attractive, that I could go off to this civilized town and just get on with it. So I came to the University of Toronto, and then in the mid-80s, we discovered how to make more complicated neural nets so they could solve those problems that the simple ones couldn't solve. He and his collaborators developed a multi-layer neural network, a deep neural network. And this started to work in a lot of ways. But again, they hit a ceiling. Through the 90s, into the 2000s, Jeff was one of only a handful of people on the planet who were still pursuing this technology. He would show up at academic conferences and be banished to the back rooms. He was treated as really like a pariah. But Jeff was consumed by this and couldn't stop. He just kept pursuing the idea that computers could learn until about 2006, when the world catches up to Hinton's ideas. Computers were now a lot faster. And now it's behaving like I thought it would behave in the mid 80s, it's solving everything. The arrival of super fast chips and the massive amounts of data produced on the internet gave Hinton's algorithms a magical boost. Suddenly, computers could identify what was in an image. Then, they could recognize speech and translate from one language to another. By 2012, words like neural nets and machine learning were popping up on the front page of the New York Times. Next up, we have Professor Jeffrey Hinton uh, of the University of Toronto. For Hinton, this is obviously a really redemptive moment. Now he's basically a technology celebrity. And for Canada, it's the country's moment as well. They have more AI researchers than just about any other place on the planet. And the quest now is to see what these guys can do, starting companies and pushing the technology forward. I'm gonna set out on a journey across Canada to see the best in Canadian AI technology and to get a feel for how far the technology has come and how far it still has to go. Here is a city that gets right at the central tension of modern life and the unfolding AI revolution. It's Montreal, a place filled with beauty and old world charms that ask you to move slowly through its streets and to chill for a while, reflect, and think deep thoughts. At the same time, it's one of the world's top AI research centers. Students flock here from all over the globe to get deep with machine learning 
and to take Jeff Hinton's ideas and figure out how to turn them into products we all use. To see just how successful they've been, look no further than your pocket. All this stuff started out as hardcore computer science, but over the last five years, AI has invaded our everyday lives. Your smartphone is packed full of AI-powered apps, including something like Google Translate that lets you point your phone at a magazine that's written in French and read it as if you were a local. Engineers have been trying to get computers to translate text like this for decades, but it was Jeff's neural nets that finally made it possible. Thanks, Jeff. And it's not just your smartphone. Neural networks are heading for the open road. Off we go. Meet my friend Stefan, the head of Montreal's Tesla fan club. I'm driving a Tesla for a little bit more than four years and a half. Do you have people asking you for rides all the time? Yes, all the time. <laughs> Maybe that's because of his fancy pants autopilot, Tesla's semi-autonomous driving system that kicks in when road conditions are right. So that's it, autopilot's on. Yes, and it's driving by itself. So we need to pay attention, but we don't have to drive. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Self-driving cars are packed full of cameras, sensors, and radar. When teamed with computer vision neural nets, it's this technology that lets the cars build a picture of the world. The technology has a long way to go, but this Tesla can monitor all the cars around it, switch lanes, and park, all by itself. Thanks, Jeff. So you're living in the future. <laughs> you know, when you try it once, it's very difficult to do without it because I just can be relaxed and we can drive like this. Oops, <laughs> there's a stop sign. So that's why we still need to pay attention. <laughs> a big part of Hinton's legacy lies beyond these examples of AI in the world. He's also inspired a legion of disciples spreading the good word of neural nets. Yashua Bengio is a professor at the University of Montreal. He's one of the researchers who glommed on to Hinton's ideas when it seemed to make little sense to do so. Over the years, he's formed a mind meld with Hinton, and together, they've come up with many of the key concepts behind modern AI. You guys worked on this stuff through the 80s, 90s, the 2000s, and then it just seemed like this totally went from computer science and research to we see it everywhere in our lives. Are you, you know, are even you surprised what's happened the last five years that it, that it really is yeah. like sitting on all our phones? And the, the rate at which the progress and the industrial products have been coming out is totally something we didn't expect. Even now, it's hard to predict where are we going? Is it going to slow down? Or are we going to continue with this exponential increase? It's thanks to Yashua that Montreal is full of top-notch AI graduate talent. This, in turn, has brought tech giants like Google and Facebook to town along with their ample checkbooks. To me, it seems like if you're good at AI, you can make two, $300,000 a year. It's crazy to see how much these guys get paid now. A million dollars is something quite common as a salary. Have you ever had a country offer you an incredible amount of money to come set up a lab there? Not a country, but yeah, companies, yeah. But Yashua has rejected the lucrative offers of Big Neural Net. He remains committed to the ivory towers of academia, which is a better fit for his philosophical approach to AI. 
you've got guys like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking that sometimes paint this technology in a very, very dark light that it could run amok and start doing things on its own. What, you know, what do you feel when you hear people say things like that? I'm not concerned about technology running amok. Of, uh, the Terminator scenario, I think, is not very credible. And uh, I also believe that if we're able to build machines that are as, as smart as us, they're also smart enough to understand our values and to understand our moral system and, and, and so act in a way that's good for us. Now, I think there are real concerns which is essentially misuse of AI to influence people's minds. It's already happening with political advertising. Yeah, I mean, we've already seen like the stuff from Facebook. So I think we should be careful about this. And try to regulate the use of AI in places where it's morally wrong, ethically wrong. I think we just should just ban it and make it, you know, illegal. It's comforting that Yashua has these concerns. But hop down the road from the university, and reality, or what's left of it, becomes messier. This tiny room is the home to a startup called Liarbird. It was founded by Yashua's former students and has built an app that can clone your voice. Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? This is huge. It can make us say anything now, really anything. One of its founders is this guy. Mexican expat Jose. He taught me the art of the clone. So you will need to record yourself for a few minutes of audio. Thousands of letters danced across the amateur author's screen. When you start to eat like this, something is the matter. You guys better quit politics and take in washing. I don't know where that one came from. <laughs> Okay, so create my digital voice now. Creating your digital voice takes at least one minute. One minute, my God. Yeah, so before, to create some uh, artificial voice of someone, you would need to record yourself for um, at least uh, eight hours. Test your voice. All right, so now I get to type something. Yeah, so the moment of the truth. Okay. Once Liarbird's AI has worked its magic, after I'm done typing. Oh, I gotta spell better. Any words I put into the app can be played back in my digital voice. And here's the crazy thing. Even words I never actually said in the first place. Artificial intelligence technology seems to be advancing very quickly. Should we be afraid? I mean, I can definitely hear my voice in there. That's, that is, that's really interesting. I just picked those words at random, and I definitely did not say some of them. And it's like flawless in being able to sort of pick from just about any word and, and manufacture it. Hello, world is the best show I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> this technology seems sweet, but lends itself to all manner of trickery. I've popped back to my hotel to test out the Liarbird technology a little bit, and you can see some really obvious ways that this could be abused. This is, this is fake Donald Trump talking. The United States is considering, in addition to other options, stopping all trade with any country doing business with North Korea. And then you could picture somebody taking over your voice and creating some mayhem in your personal life. Now, to really put my computer voice to the test, I am going to call my dear, sweet mother and see if she recognizes me. Hey, Mom. Hi. What are you guys up to today? Um, well, it's shut down. We didn't have any electricity early this morning, and we're just hanging around the house. I'm just finishing up work and waiting for the boys to get home. OK. I think I'm coming down with a virus. Oh, why well, you feel bad, hey? <laughs> I was messing around with you. You were talking to a computer. I felt like I was talking to you. It's amazing. <laughs> Is that scary or, or good? It could be scary if it was something really important. But you now, is it, Ash? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like you. Is it? Yes, 
The real artificial intelligence weirdos in Canada live here, in Edmonton. This is a large, but very, very cold and very, very flat city that is more or less in the middle of nowhere. It's the kind of place that has a giant butter vault to help people survive the lean winter months. Canadians like to put the best possible spin on how these conditions bring out interesting traits in people. Ask anyone, like this guy from the Edmonton Tourist Center. Well, Edmonton's uh, one of those cities that isn't, you know, automatically listed in the top cities in Canada in terms of size or scale or, or, or notice even, but it's always had a really neat quality to it of that Western independent spirit that you see very much in, in Alberta in general, combined with a, a conscience and a, a thoughtfulness. Over at the University of Alberta, some of the most far out AI research in the world is taking place. The man I'm here to see is the university's very own AI godfather, Rich Sutton. Rich is considered one of the great revolutionary thinkers in AI. You are not Canadian. <laughs> I am Canadian. You are, <laughs> but not by birth. Uh, no, I was born in the US, but uh, now I'm just Canadian. Okay, and what brought you to Canada? The politics, I wanted to get away from difficult times in the United States. The United States was invading other countries in 2003 when I came here, and I didn't care for all that. Sutton entered the field of AI in the mid 80s. And like Jeff Hinton and Yashua Bengio, he was a big believer in neural networks. But Sutton has a different idea about how to further the technology. Unlike Hinton's method of feeding neural networks reams and reams of data and telling them what to do, Sutton wants them to learn more naturally from experience, an approach called reinforcement learning. Well, reinforcement learning, it's like what animals do and what people do. You try several things, the things that work best, you keep doing those, and things that don't work out so well, you stop doing them. And how do you teach a computer um, well, you, that, all you that, need, that idea? <laughs> all you need is a sense, the computer has to have a sense of what's good and what's bad. And so you give it a special signal called the reward. If the reward is high, that means it's good. If the reward is low, that means it's bad. To see reinforcement learning in action, I found Marlos, an industrious young Brazilian who's created an AI to play his video games for him. His algorithm plays the game thousands of times and gradually learns from experience how to do better. So the goal of this game is that you are this yellow blob. And what you have to do is that you have to get as many potions as you can while avoiding harpies. And this is like the AI going at this for the first time. It's the AI who run it for the first time. So it just bumps into things. If it gets points, it's happy. If it dies, it's unhappy. Yes. And the AI starts to figure out that maybe what I want to do is to collect these potions and avoid the harpies. And now we can look at AI that has ran for 5,000 games. OK. And this is what it looks like. You can tell that it's smarter about its strategy. Yes. Then, then what happens if you run it 500,000 times? Oh, we, we get to the superhuman performance level. Though notching a high score is the noblest of pursuits, reinforcement learning has turned out to have all kinds of other applications. It's behind the algorithm that recommends movies and TV shows on Netflix and Amazon. It beat the world champion Go player, a feat previously thought impossible for a computer. Soon, it could read your brain waves and determine whether you have a mental disorder. But for Sutton, all that is just the beginning. We are trying to make real intelligence. We're trying to recreate human intelligence. Humans are our example. He sees reinforcement learning as the path to what futurists call the singularity, the moment when our AI creations light up and surge past human-level intelligence. Do you have a date for the singularity, or? So you give you, uh, it's, a, it's a quite broad probability distribution, and the median is at 2040. 2040. So that means equal chance of being before or after 2040. Okay. The rationale goes like this. Uh, by 2030, we'll have the hardware. 
So give guys like me uh, another 10 years to figure out the algorithms, yeah. the software to go with the hardware to do it. It's gonna be exciting where we're going. If 2040 seems like a long time to wait to meet a smart robot, do not fret. Over in the experimental wing of the university, there are co-eds hard at work blurring the line between humans and machines. Are you human? Of course not, but that shouldn't keep us from chatting. Case in point, homegrown Edmontonian genius, Corey Mathewson. Tell me about this guy a little bit, or... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so this is Blueberry. Uh, on Blueberry, I've deployed the improv system. So there's an artificial improv system running on Blueberry right now. Yes, that's right. Corey does improv comedy with a robot. I've been doing improv longer than I've been doing computing science. I've been doing it for 12 years, and I thought, you know, there's no more natural convergence than taking some of these state-of-the-art systems and putting them up on stage. One day we'll make it to the moon if this planet is not to be our last. It is the sky and the moon of the universe, the sun, the, the sun. sun. <laughs> the sky, the moon, and the universe, the, the sun, sun, the sun. <laughs> I keep thinking it's like a ventriloquist sort of. This is like a new age. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good way to put really it, yeah. Strange yeah. twist on it. The piece that's different is that I don't know what it, it will say. Blueberry, I, I created you. I downloaded a voice into your brain so that you could perform in front of these people. But I do not know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to say either. To give Blueberry the power of surreal Canadian improv, Corey made use of some tech that should be familiar by now, a neural network. Step one, he feeds the network the dialogue from a bunch of movies, 102,000 movies to be exact. All the movies, every movie for 100 years. And that's just so it can learn language, see how somebody responds to somebody else. That's exactly right, yeah, it builds kind of a language model. Step two, he uses reinforcement learning to train the network, rewarding it when it makes sense and punishing it when it spits out gibberish. Time to put this wannabe kid in the hall to the test. There we go. Start improvising. Okay, campers, we're gonna get ready for a real baseball game. Grab your gloves and grab your baseball bats and let's get out there. Especially you, Franklin. Of course, I will not be much longer. Okay, okay, well, why aren't you ready for the match? I do not have any more good news if I were your boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on, Franklin. You know how I feel about you, but you gotta keep your head in the game right now. You will see if you do not stop here when you go, what have you done? <laughs> It's threatening you. I know. I'll huh? teach you what the character of your team is going to do. To you. Oh, Jesus. Put down the bat, Franklin. What are you doing? You have nothing to hide, that's all. <laughs> I, I've got nothing to hide. Look, this is all I am. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> end it there. That's great, That's man. sort of how so, it works. Obviously, some of the responses are a little bit weird, but then it's really funny, because then as you're going along, it did hit a couple things perfectly, and, and then it's like, yeah. I mean, it's extra hilarious because oh, now, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now it's going. Blueberry may not be ready for its Second City audition just yet, but Corey has a higher purpose, making AI relatable. Oh, it's going to move. It's going to move. It's going to move. Holy crap. <laughs> there is a fear in society of AI. So we are kind of humanizing this AI. We're, we're taking it down a peg. We're saying, don't be afraid of this tech. Look at how cute it is. Look at how kind of naive it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Filters. <laughs> You've done it again, Blueberry. Yes. Isn't there a flip side to that, though? Then you make it cute, and, and then people start to accept it, and you know, then, then we wake up. And... <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think that will happen in my time. The singularity may be near, or it may be not so near. But if the inhabitants of this oddly beautiful place keep pushing the technology, they just might create something alarmingly human-like one day. 
for Rich Sutton, it's not a question of whether we'll get there, but whether we'll be able to accept our mechanized brethren. Our society will be, will be challenged. You know, it's just like every time, you know, our black people, people, our women, people, we will do the same thing with robots eventually. Uh, are they allowed to own property? Are they allowed to earn an income? Or do they have to be owned by somebody? But a robot's obviously not a person. <laughs> right? No. <laughs> Last stop, I return to Toronto, home to 2.8 million people, one very tall tower, and of course, the godfather himself. Inside the system, there's lots of little processes which are a little bit like brain cells. They work a he may be an import, but Jeff Hinton has done something truly exceptional for Toronto. He's turned this city into an AI mecca, where AI conferences like this one seem to take place daily. We are enormously thankful to Canadians for inventing all this stuff, because we now use it throughout our entire business. You should never we say have this. it on record that he owes, <laughs> that Google owes Canada. We, we'll we absolutely owe Canada. <laughs> that was a mistake. And the tech industry is full of people who adore AI. And then also some famous types like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, who said, well, that AI might be the end of us. <laughs> to consider such dystopia in the proper light, I've come to Toronto's geekiest bar. Hello, George. To encase myself in this steel container with George Dvorsky. He's a writer for Gizmodo and an AI philosopher. Well, since we're in the apocalyptic bar, what is the the con case around AI? What, what's what's the nastiest scenario that everybody's worried about? Unfortunately, there's there's no shortage of nasty scenarios, and this I think this is what makes artificial intelligence such a scary thing is all the different ways that it can go wrong. It can be everything from an accident, you know, where we just didn't think it through. We gave a, a, a very powerful computer instructions to do something. We thought we explained it articulately. We thought we gave it a concrete goal, and it completely took a different path than we thought it would in such a way that it actually caused some great damage. And I'm sure you've heard the old paperclip example, yeah. where uh, you're a paperclip manufacturer and you say, hey, we need lots of paperclips. And because the artificial intelligence has so much reach and so much power, it actually starts to go about converting all of the matter and all the molecules on the planet into paperclips. Before you know it, we've now converted the entire cosmos into paperclips. It's a crazy scenario, but it's an illustrative scenario. We can't be dismissive of the perils. I think that's ex exceptionally dangerous. And I don't think it's too early to start raising the alarm bells about it. Being turned into Clippy sounds awful. But fear not, we'll have years to ease into that sort of suffering as AI steadily plucks off one job after another. The first to go, of course, will likely be the always screwed factory workers. Which brings us to Suzanne Gildert, a budding AI overlord and founder of robotics startup Kindred AI. Tell me about these guys. So these are research prototypes. So they're some of the first robots we built at Kindred. We tend to work with small robots. It's a bit like uh, if you imagine a, a child growing up and it breaks a lot of things. Now imagine if the child was six feet tall when it had the brain of a six month old, it would be a terrible, <laughs> terribly dangerous. How many of these robots have ever slapped you? Uh, I have been hit in the face by robots a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> and it's how like Suzanne that. seems nice enough. <laughs> she makes exotic digital art. And she loves cats to the point where she's built a robotic fleet of them for the office. This one I believe is called Pinkfoot. 
It's a quadruped robot loosely based on a cat anatomy, although it's uh, not a very highly faithful representation yet. And then when you were growing up, you would build things as well? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So I was really uh, enthralled by electronics at an early age. I guess most little girls would be looking at trays of, of beads and things, and I was looking at trays of like resistors and capacitors and little components, but having the same kind of reaction to them. But don't be fooled by the hobby electronics and the cute cat bots. Suzanne is a keen businesswoman. And Kindred has recently embarked on its first commercial venture. What's going on here is that we have a bank of robots that are learning. So they are continuously running, uh, picking up objects. And these would run all day? All day, all night. Powered by a neural network, these arms can do something that's very easy for a human, but very hard for a bot. Pick up objects of different shapes and put them down. Most factories still use people to do that sort of thing. Lots and lots of people. Today, everyone's shopping on e-commerce. Thousands and thousands of different types of objects, shapes, textures, weights. How do you pick that up? Right now, it's humans. You have millions of humans in warehouses just like picking up things and putting it into another location. So we're teaching our robots how to do that. What's the hard part? It's figuring out what's a belt, what's a shirt, or it's just how to grasp it. Yeah, exactly. It's figuring out how to pick it up, right? So, so things will show up in any shape, right? And you've got to figure out how to pick it up without dropping it, uh, put it in the location. So it takes a lot of training. Part of that training involves, of all things, humans. Robot pilots who manually control the arms, while the AI watches and learns the finer points of grabbing. Is there something grim about the human training there? And it, yeah, it's not good to take people's jobs away, but this kind of technology coming into the workforce should make us start thinking about how we're going to pay people in the future, because AI is not just going to automate you know, manual labor jobs. It's going to automate things like doctors and lawyers and accountants very soon. So I think there's going to be issues. There's going to be a lot of disruption. Suzanne is a realist, but she's also an optimist. In her vision of the future, robots won't be mindless competitors to humanity. They'll be full-fledged citizens like the rest of us. One of the crazy ideas I've seen you talk about was you've got a robot and it's working in a factory and then it's got to go, maybe it gets paid a wage and it goes to buy lithium ion yeah. batteries to keep it going. Why would that have to happen? I mean, if you're having a physical body, they will have a lot of physical needs, just like we have. You might have to go to the repair shop to get like a motor looked at or something like that, and they'll have to pay someone to do that. I think they'll just be contributing to our economy in the same way we do. And if they have brains like us, they'll want to explore new things they've never seen before. They'll want to learn things. They'll want to perhaps rest so that their mind has time to consolidate all this new information. I keep trying to picture it in my head, though. So this is the robot worker. Does he go home and sit on the couch and watch <laughs> TV after work? And he's... I don't see why not. I'd yeah. probably watch cat videos like the rest of us. I mean, when, when you... It's hard to tell sometimes if Suzanne is laughing with us or at us. But she's not alone in her cautious optimism for the future. I think there's always a sense that, you know, technology can be either used for good or used for bad. Uh, I'm reassured that, that Canada is part of it uh, in terms of trying to set us on the right path. On the whole, being responsible and thoughtful about the power we're gaining by research and learning is the right trend line. And I don't think AI is automatically doomed to some dystopian outcome. We're told that politicians will come up with policies that address massive job loss and prevent horrific inequality between the classes. 
and we're told that these guys will take so long to become human-like that we need not be afraid for a while. The truth, though, is that we're turning ourselves over to the unknown here. So, you know, fingers crossed. Eventually, I think we will become the AIs. We will become the intelligent machines. We will understand how things can be smart and we can deliberately create them. So it's, you might think of it as making a new generation, new kinds of people. Humanity is continuing to evolve, and why wouldn't enhanced people or even designed people be the next step in humanity? It's really hard to predict the future. I think there's going to be all sorts of things happen we didn't expect. But there's one thing that we can predict. This technology is going to change everything. Goodbye. 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 Once I power you down, that's it. And if you do not mind, I will never see you again.